Hello everyone, let's try this again. I was just about five minutes into this film and my Atomos Ninja screen just died and said no input. So yes, my tech woes continue. So we're gonna jump right into the Q&A. First of all, thank you for everyone that sent in uh, questions. I really appreciate that. And also remember, I am one person with one opinion. Your experience opinion might be totally different. That is completely fine. By the way, Next week, I have a little adapter for the hot shoe so that the screen is gonna go on top of the camera instead of below it, because I know it looks like I'm staring to just below camera because I'm staring to just below camera. Now, I know someone's gonna ask my, my bracelet. I asked my wife to make this bracelet. Uh, she makes jewelry. She has something called Amala Studio. You will see there are three bands. This band is the good part of me. This band is the bad part of me. And the band in the middle is a reminder that that's where I'm supposed to be, in the middle of good and evil. Life is about balance. Let's jump right in. I had two questions about ethics in photojournalism. One from someone who wrote in and said that his experience with, with photojournalism was based on the Lou Grant television program, and there was a character called Animal who was a photographer. I'm dating myself because I actually remember that show. And basically, it's about if you're working for someone, are you supposed to be objective? You're working for Time or Newsweek, or is the, do the photos trump that, or can you put your own personal opinion in? Ethics is a very slippery slope. When it comes to photography and ethics, if you go back over the last 15 or 20 years, you can find plenty of infractions from major organizations to minor organizations to famous photographers to little known photographers, ethics, oh man, it's, this is a really tough thing to answer. I have seen photographers pay to set up photographs. I've seen photographers just set them up without paying. I've seen photographers pay civilians to keep other photographers out of a scene so that they would have an exclusive. I've seen all kinds of things. Um, staging a photograph in journalism is, a, is grounds for firing, and yet these people are still working as photographers. So, and I have heard uh, dozens and dozens of stories about sort of unsavory behavior by photographers. Having said that, the vast majority of people out there working in journalism and photojournalism are trying to do the right thing. It is very difficult to be 100% objective at times, and that is where the hierarchy inside the paper comes into play, or the magazine. That's where the editor, the photo editor, the associate managing editor, the publisher, these are all trained professionals. Each basically is coming with their own agenda, their own history, their own environment, which can have an impact on what runs, what gets seen, what doesn't, what kind of ethical decisions they make. There is no such thing as a perfect world. There's no such thing as a free lunch. A lot of these organizations these days are owned by huge corporate uh, entities that have agendas. They have policy in terms of what's going to run, what's not, how things are going to be uh, going to be slanted or things are going to be run. As an individual, you have to do the best you possibly can. That means not manipulating your photographs, not adding and subtracting things in the frame, and not doing stories to purposely fit a personal agenda. It can be hard. Practice, doing the right thing, that's all I can say. It's really hard. Uh, Time and Newsweek, I don't know how, I've only, uh, it's been so long since I've, I've been around any of those uh, organizations. I don't think I ever photographed for Newsweek. I assisted for someone who shot a lot for time. I'm trying to think, one of the news magazines I did something for a long time ago, but God, it's been so long, I don't know. I'm on my own now, so my ethical decisions are my own. I have no corporate entity over the top of me. I shoot about twice a year, so who cares? Okay, moving on. Question number two. And I said this before, I treat all questions equally. What kind of music have you been enjoying lately? Oh, my phone's in the other room. Let me think about the things that I have listened to and on Pandora uh, in the last three days. I've listened to Tyler Childers, who I think is a great guitar player, songwriter, very soulful lyrics. I've listened to Damian Marley. And by the way, the entire Marley family, from Bob to Rita to Ziggy to Steven to Julian to uh, Damian, they're all great. They're all different. I love Damian Marley, and I discovered him probably the, the latest of all of them. I also love Stephen Marley. I've seen Ziggy Marley in concert, and I think Bob deserves a Lifetime Humanitarian Award because reggae music has probably spread as much joy around the world as any music source I can think of. But I also listen to a lot of ambient music like Brian Eno. I listen to Indian classical music. I listen to, uh, I do not listen to country. That's where I draw the line. So that's the kind of music I listen to lately. Number 
Three, film digital micro four thirds or phone cameras is the quality of an image affected by the quality of an image, if you see what I mean. No, not at all. There's no reason to even have a conversation about camera technology or, or file size or sensor type or any of that stuff. That is a conversation for amateurs. Professionals don't have these conversations. They'll ask, they'll ask one another, does a camera work? What do you think of it? What are the drawbacks? Does it have a shutter lag? How's the finder? all of the stuff that actually makes a difference when you're making pictures in the field, the rest of it doesn't matter. It's, um, it's just a conversation that's, that's a huge part of the online photo community and that's where it ends. The, the, the key ingredients to making good photographs are light, timing, composition, practice, and finding how you see the world that's different from anyone else. And those are all the things that are hard, that take a lot of time, which is why you hardly hear anything about them online. Everybody online is talking about camera technology because that's what the geeks want, and there's a lot more geeks than there are photographers, and they drive numbers, they drive traffic, they drive likes and subscriptions. So it's a conversation that's mind-numbing to me. On the book side, I would equate it to the conversation about color management. It is the most god-awful, boring thing you could possibly imagine, and I try not to ever have it. I know that sounds harsh, but man, it just doesn't matter. I'm using a Fuji X-T4. I don't care anything about the, the tech specs of this camera. Does the autofocus work? Is there a shutter lag? How's the viewfinder? That's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about with a camera. In terms of the file size, no idea. I don't care. It's overkill for everything I would ever need. And if I needed something bigger, I could go get something bigger. But I don't remember the last time ever that a client dictated to me what camera system I needed to use. Now, if you're shooting for, let's say, a, a, let's say that you're shooting one of the, the Hobbit movies, right? And you you're doing you're doing advertising, you're doing the commercial side, you're doing maybe even on-set stuff, even though those are two different industries, three different industries, really. Maybe there's a requirement for file sizes for billboards or for some special effect that they need for the movie. Maybe. But that's it. The rest of us, we got no business talking about this stuff. Question number four, tough love. Is there any way other than just diving in to gain insight on editing photographs? I cannot seem to find anywhere on the internet or even in traditional books a guide of the tenets of editing. A cookbook would be helpful. I always feel like I could go back and forth in Lightroom sliders, never certain if I'm in the right spot. The short answer is no. I mean, I'm sure there's probably something out there, but editing, editing is a lost art. When I came up in photography, every style of photography I did, which was primarily in the journalism side, so photojournalism, newspaper, uh, freelance editorial, there were full-time picture editors. So at the paper, every single day when I came back from assignments at the paper, the photo editor was there and they were looking at every single thing you did. That is all they did was edit photographs and they were really good at it. They were better than you and better than me. Those people all went away for because they were expensive, they were tenured, the industry got sloppy, digital came in and flooded us with average content, no one seemed to care anymore. There are still full-time photo editors and they are still very good at what they do. You also have full-time book editors. They are very good at what they do. I've had plenty of personal experience in dealing with some of these folks and watching them work their magic on a set of images or a set of book pages. So the key here is to really practice. Number one, you can look at photography books and look at how they've been edited and sequenced and why the photo editors and the team of people who put that book together, why did they do what they do? The second thing you can do is to print your photograph. So if you come back from a story and you've made your edit and you have whatever, 25 images, print them all very small, very inexpensively. They don't have to be fancy prints. You don't have to show them anyone and lay them out on a table and begin to see what works and what doesn't and what fits where. That is what I do when I make books. That is what a lot of other photographers do when they make books is to make those small prints because it's much, much better editing that way than it is trying to do this in the digital space. And as far as Lightroom goes, Lightroom is just an, a manipulation software. That's your post-processing and archiving, your digital asset management software that allows you to quickly edit your images, do your selects, apply whatever presets you want or whatever manipulation you're doing to your images, then export those, archive them, and move on. Once you've exported your files from your Lightroom folder, then you're going to want to make those small prints and lay them out. Making the small prints is very important because you have to pay for them. It's time consuming and it's slow and it makes you put critical thought towards your work. The digital space often does not. People are lazy in the digital space and they don't edit as tight as they should and practice. Again, there's also photo editors out there. You can go to a photo festival, you can pay to have your portfolio reviewed and you can specifically seek out people who are photo editors 
and you can talk to them about what it means to edit. And editing is, it can be ruthless because you're, you're, you're taking your children in these photographs and you're saying, I, don't, I can't use you anymore. I don't need you anymore. And that can be very difficult, but that's the beauty of editing. Less is more. Cliche alert. Cliche, cliche alert. Question number five, or four, six, somewhere around there. Did you use zone focusing during your photojournalism days? Very little. I could have because I shot like a rangefinder film cameras and you can do the little zone zone focus thing on the barrel, lens barrel. Um, I did occasionally, but most of the time I liked focusing. It made me feel like I was actually doing something. And you get so used to it and so quick with it, it just becomes second nature and you're not thinking about it. But that comes from shooting every single day for years. If you haven't done that and you haven't gotten to that point, it could seem like zone focusing would be a shortcut, and in some cases it is, but I like, I don't know, for whatever reason, that was my wife sneezing. I like to um, focus myself. Even my Fuji, I have, I put a manual focus lens on it, so what sense does that make? Question six, how many photo books do you own? How many do you buy per month or year? Are there individual artists or agency book collections? Cheers from the land of Tim Tams. <sighs> Tim Tams, doesn't matter what flavor doesn't matter the size of the bag. It doesn't matter what mood you're in. It doesn't matter where you're going or if your flight is delayed. It doesn't matter if you're swimming to Australia. Tim Tam is the singular most important creation in the history of the world. I love you, Tim Tam. Okay, um, I try not to buy photo books now. To my left, there's probably 120 photo books. You can see this behind me. I have this stack and I have a ton more back in storage and I'm trying not to buy more. I'm trying to cut down. My goal is to donate all of these books to an organization that will allow people to come in and actually get their hands on them. I don't want quiet. I don't want stodgy. I don't want uh, exclusive uh, book, pe book people. I want anyone who's interested in photography should be able to get their hands on these books and use them until they wear out. Now, my wife will fight me on this, which means I'm gonna lose. So the books will probably be around, but my goal is to trim down and spend as much time as possible on the road in the van. And even when I'm here, I don't need a lot of stuff. So having said that, I still end up buying books, but there's no rhyme or reason to it. A friend who has a very peculiar uh, publishing system is about to put a book out and we're definitely gonna buy that book. So I still buy them, but I would say it's a trickle instead of a flood. For a long time it was a flood and now I've got other expenses like Continental 2.2 Black Chili Race Kings on my Salsa Fargo Titanium. People, I got priorities. So my money has to go here and there and here and there. Uh, and in terms of individual artists, no, it's anyone that makes a book that's interesting. I just got an amazing blur book in the mail this morning from Paul. Paul, I'm not going to use your last name in case you don't want me to use your last name. It finally arrived. It's a book that reminds me of my family. It's a soft cover eight by 10 book. It's about a very personal and, and tragic event that happened in his life. And I, I took one look at the pages this morning and I was like, this is a great book. This is really great. So he's probably, I don't think you're a well-known photographer. Uh, it's a blurb, blurb platform open to anyone, and yet he has a book that resonates with me as much as anything on the shelf over here. So it doesn't matter who it is or agencies or anything like that. Seven, if you could go back in time and change one thing in your career, what would it be? Ooh, man, I would change so many things. I would ask for the, you know, when the genie gives you three wishes, my first wish from the genie would be I want 100 more wishes. So I would change a lot of things. I, uh, I would start with working more and working harder than I did. And I still, I worked hard, I think in comparison to some folks, but I could have done a lot more. And the second thing I would have done is I would not have put the rest of my life on hold for so long. All the things that I was doing prior to becoming a photographer, much of which was in the outdoor world. I was bird hunting and fishing, traveling to bird hunt and fish. I was doing a lot of hiking. I was doing a lot of camping. I was doing all kinds of things outdoors. And I basically just put it on hold because I spent all this time working as a photographer and that was all I did. And I think for that long stretch of time, almost three decades, I was a pretty boring individual. I didn't read nearly enough. I didn't write nearly enough. I didn't expand my horizons. Even looking back on my education, I got a degree in photojournalism uh, and I never took advantage of going to school overseas. UT Austin had, I'm sure, a myriad of, of sister schools around the world, never took advantage, never tried. That's a mistake. I think that would have probably significantly changed my life. My original goal was to study geology. I should have continued along that path, even though I wasn't going to do it as a as a major or a career, it's a very interesting topic to me that I'm, I am still curious about. So again, what, much more well-rounded and I would have worked a lot harder. And, and also, 
young photographer, you're enamored by all the things that don't matter. That's another mistake. Uh, two, the other mistake too is thinking that the public cared about what I was doing. Not really. They don't really care that much. So it's easy to sort of get wrapped in your head that what you're doing is important and that who you are is important. And in the grand scheme, it's really not that. Even the top, top, top people in the world, I think their influence is very slight, but occasionally strategic. Uh, I think the three days ago when the Capitol building was taken over, Ron Haviv, David Buteau, Jim Lascalzo, those people who are in there covering that, they just made history. Those images are going to be around forever. That has not happened in my lifetime. It may never happen again. And those folks were in there doing what they do. And that's important. Number eight, what is the point about changing mindset in a photo book? This is a great question. So this person is saying when he looks at photo books nowadays, he sees a shift from content oriented photo book to art object, design object oriented objects with less emphasis on the actual photographs. Very insightful. I started to see this when the digital revolution took hold. Suddenly digital, which was when digital, this is the crazy thing about digital. When the digital cameras first arrived, the idea was in the dialogue in the industry was that photographers would be able to spend more time in the field because the technology meant you didn't have to do film and processing. So you, you saved that time, which would give you more time in the field and less time back at the, back at the lab or back at the headquarters. The problem was the second that editors found out that you could make a picture instantly, they just cut field time and gave you twice as many assignments. So people didn't spend more time in the field. They basically were having to transmit from their car out of a parking lot because now they had 14 assignments instead of seven. I saw this happen where long form documentary photography or what I would call and other people have called reality based photography, which is very time consuming, very expensive and very hard to do, started to not disappear. But, but fall off in terms of how many people were actually doing this. And what it started to get replaced by were, if I can generalize, portrait series, which were called documentary, and also what I would call urban abstract landscape photography, which by the way, the hipsters have picked up on and they love it. L abstract urban landscape photography has no model release, no location release, no, uh, no need to engage with anyone. You can go out in a weekend, bang out a bunch of random buildings and tell people you have a project and then spend two months of your life marketing this project relentlessly or two years. The same for portrait series. I noticed back in the, um, in the early 2000s going to Paris to things like Perry Photo, which is the biggest photo show in the world, I saw a, a dramatic change in the style of work that was being delivered and titled under documentary. Portrait series suddenly became the rage because again, you can do a portrait series in a weekend and call that long-term work. The Sebastio Salgados of the world spending 10 years on a project, those people, Salgado's doing his thing and always will and he's unlike anybody else and he's one of, if not the best modern era documentary photographer ever, but there are fewer and fewer and fewer of, of him out there because of the time and the requirements and the budgets that are required to do that work. Younger photographers are like, I don't want to spend that time. I need to sort of gain my relevance now. I need to gain my traction now. I need to build a following. And it shifted how things were made. I also think you see a shift from reportage, documentary photography to conceptual photography, because again, you can ride on the concept and that quality or even quantity of the images that you've made in the field can taper off. So it's a, it's, it's a reflection of our culture and society and industry more than anything else. But that's a really good question and very insightful in my opinion. Almost done. Oh, this is about AG23 uh, talking about where we're at. People are still frustrated trying to get the magazine. I get that. Uh, but you have to understand how bad the shipping industry is right now. A friend sent me a letter on October 31st from California and it just got here. It's January. I think it got here a week ago. So two and a half, two, over two months to get here from California. So that tells you how bad it is. Now there are mail forwarding organizations, which are worth investigating. If you live overseas, you can buy it from the beyond site for free, pay five bucks for shipping. It goes to this mail forwarding service. They will forward it to you around the world. Issue one is sold out. We're working on issue two. Now we got it paid for at the end of last year. We have budget for multiple issues in 2021. I have 
told, admitted to myself, I'm going to spend a lot more time on AG this year than I did last year because it is, it's expanding, it's snowballing, I love it. And issue two is being designed as we speak. Two days ago, I got an email from the designer and she said, here is my hypothetical cover for the second issue. If I can make it work, we're gonna need something extra for when the, when the zine comes out. And uh, it looks unbelievable. I'm not gonna tell you what it is and I'm not gonna show you what it is, but it looks good. So we're moving forward. It's, uh, it's a ton of work. Um, it's expensive to put it together. Beyond, again, has, has bent over backwards to make sure that we have the budgets we need to continue this project. And even when the designer said, if I can make this work, we're gonna need something new. In my head, anytime you hear that phrase, something new, that means budget. So someone is going to have to pay for this. My father used to bludgeon me with an expression that I think is right on the money. My father used to say there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Behind everything, there is somebody with a checkbook putting it out. And I think there's a lot of people in the photo space who want the photo space to be some object of purity. That's, that's this wonderland of rainbows and unicorns. But the truth is, it is a business like anything else. And so, yes, when I saw the design of this, I said, if, if it costs extra to add something else in, we have to find a way to do that. So whether that's blur stepping up to the plate or that's me personally, because I don't think it's gonna cost that much and I'm willing to pay for it myself because I think for you as a viewer, you would absolutely freak out if we can get this to work. So it's worth it. And that's where we are with AG. I think hopefully this year we will have at least issue two, two and three for sure and potentially a four. And again, connecting all the contributors, building a database of contributors and building a society of people around the world. And frankly, our mission statement is very basic to uh, promote understanding through dialogue and art. Our goal is to just to print stories that we think are interesting, put them in front of you and say, we think this is interesting. You might as well. We're not telling you what to think. We have a very centrist position on everything because we're sick of people drawing lines in the sand. Put a story out, you make your own decisions. We think these contributors are great and we think this story is interesting. That's all, thanks for asking. Let's do two more. Is it weird that you are my man crush? No, not at all. I think every single person watching this channel, I'm the man crush. It's totally normal. It's what YouTube is about, right? Um, can you advise me on a yoga style for beginners. Yes, very easy. Yoga is a wonderful thing. I'm not gonna get all woo woo on you and I'm not in Lotus right now. You can't see me from the waist down, but trust me, I'm not in Lotus. If I was, this film would be over a long time ago. Ashtanga Sun Salutation Series. That's all you need. It's endless. And I think, frankly, in some weird way, the Ashtanga Sun Salutation Series is all any of us need. It's all anyone who ever does yoga ever needs. It is a simple routine that allows you to tap into your breathing and your mind. That is what yoga is about. The physical side of yoga is a byproduct of being able to tap your brain and your breath. I know that sounds out there. Deal with it, people. It's true. It's been around for thousands of years. It's not just me. I'm a, I'm a newcomer to this thing. But it's a wonderful thing. I, my wife and I did it this morning. It's 30 and blowing. I'm not riding my bike today, so I had to do something. But Ashtanga Sun Salutation, it's endless and it's a wonderful thing. Last question. I'm currently working on a project that's all over the place in terms of format. While I plan to stick to black and white only, what are your thoughts about mixing square and rectangular images in a book? That's fine. Mixing, mixing square and rectangular, I mean, it adds a degree of difficulty. It adds a little bit of complexity. A good book, you're looking for cohesion, cohesiveness. You don't want to throw too many wrinkles into the viewer because they can get distracted and they're gone. So, uh, but I've done it a million times. I shot Hasselblad and Leica all the time. I shot that for, I don't know what it was, two decades where I'd be in the field messing around. And half the time I was thrilled that I was doing that. And half the time I was kicking myself because I knew I should have stayed to one format. The Hasselblad is cake. It's easy. Whatever you shoot with a six by six camera, anything you shoot looks good. It fools you into thinking you're making progress where because the 35 is hard and trying to use 35 millimeter especially 35 black and white today and trying to impress someone with it is very difficult you have to you better be making some really great photographs because instagram has skewed everyone and manipulation in digital files has skewed everyone into believing that reality is not enough there has to be more than reality we have to stage things and fake things and oversaturate things 
And so 35 black and white is a really tr is a tough road to go. And so when you're working in the field, you're out there day after day after day and you're you're chipping away with a 35 black and white camera and you're thinking, man, it's been eight days since I've made a picture that's gonna make it into this story. And all of a sudden you got the Hasselblad and you go, wow, I can shoot anything. I can shoot portraits, I can shoot my feet, I can shoot my car, I can shoot, you know, backlit, cinematic, whatever. And, and you go, you convince yourself that it's good. And it's not really good. It's like empty calories. And again, I love the Hasselblad. When I do my portrait series, there's no camera I would rather have than that camera. So when I'm doing like dispatch audio interviews and I make a portrait of someone, if I had my choice of whatever camera I was gonna use, it would be the Hasselblad. The quality's great, the fall off's great. I like having a big negative. But in the documentary projects, I think I, sh I would have been better off if I had just stuck to one or the other. And there's no, you know, I could have just said, I'm going to shoot Hasselblad the whole series. Uh, but the Leica is, you know, was my primary, primary machine. So yes, you can do that. And then if you add black and white and color into the same project, you are once again, increasing your degree of difficulty, but there's plenty of people who do it. And if you can't do it, you can also hire a photo editor and they can help you get there or a book editor or someone who can help you edit and sequence for something. It's a, it's a skill. It's also fun to just practice. So, you know, let's, let's not get too serious about this whole thing. If you have fun shooting multiple formats and you have fun shooting color in black and white, who cares about the rest? Go out, swing for the fences. If you miss, you miss. And who knows, you may hit a home run. You may design something that people go, wow, this is absolutely uh, incredible. You know what I mean? Okay, that's it for this q and I'll be back with more. I appreciate it. And remember, I'm one guy with one opinion, nothing more. I hope you enjoyed. Adios.